Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I am not Lee White, but I am Will Terry. Mm -hmm. And today we have a special guest. Yep, we, we have a special guest. Her name's Mel Cherhe. And Cherhe. Uh, Cherhe. There we go. I want to add like too many syllables to it. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's spelled C E R R I. So I, I wanted to say cherry, but because uh, I don't have a good Brazilian accent. Lee White couldn't join us. He's, he's out on assignment. He's actually uh, working on um, a, another class from SVS Learn. So uh, you're going to want to check that out as soon as that drops. But so excited to talk to her today. She is a Brazilian. Um, lettering artist, like lettering illustrator. Um, uh, if you look at her work, it's it's melcherry.com. It's C M E L C E R R I dot com or go on Instagram. It's the same at M E L C E R R I on Instagram. And uh, and look at her work, it's colorful. It's uh, we described it in the she described it in the podcast as loud. Um, and it's I look at it and I'm like happy <laughs> when I look at it. Um, yeah. So what was, what was your big takeaway from, from her, from talking to her today? Well, um, it's how she's always creating and um, she's balancing a family and her art and it's, it's inspiring. Yeah. I, I liked how she called it premium hours. So she has what she calls these premium hours. And this is like four or five hours in a day where she doesn't have interruptions and she knows that like she has to make something within that time period. And she's like, if I'm, if I don't have a client job, I'm going to still use those hours to make something. And she's, but what's cool. And I, and this is something that I see all the time with very successful illustrators is they always have some sort of personal project that they're working on, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, okay, I'm not getting work, but I still am, making progress and learning and getting better on something and uh and her personal project you gotta listen you gotta listen to the end to hear what she's doing because it is um it's really cool i'm excited to see if this thing you know really takes on like the wings that that she's wanting it to she's just sort of chipping away at it but it, it would be really cool to see that thing get published uh one other thing i i took away from her she she kind of told the difference between or shared the difference between kids having kids and not having kids and the motivating factor of getting work done after you have kids. She's like, I'm mm. actually more productive with kids. So, and that's, that's been my case too. I think, I think your kids kind of focus you and, and make you realize like, uh, a, I don't have all the time in the world, and B, I don't want to have all the time in the world to work on my stuff. I want to spend time with these kids. I want to provide for these kids, so I need right. to be really efficient with with my work. So it's cool to see how she does that. And um, I don't know. Let's let's get right down into it. All right. Well, hey Mel, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate Hi, you could guys. be here. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I was not familiar with your work uh, before meeting you um, online first uh, in, in email, uh, but I instantly, when I saw it, I fell in love. I have it up on my monitor here. Um, I fell in love with it, and I want you, I would like to know, first off, describe what uh, illustration field you operate in, like what segment of the illustration world you operate in. What exactly would you call this? I do commercial illustration mostly. Um, mm -hmm. So I work for clients. Uh, um, so let's say a client needs to, a greeting card or a client needs some illustration to go on their website or for some specific communication they're sending out to, to their own clients. So usually that's where I operate, uh, work for clients and um, create illustrations to fit their specific needs. Um, and I do a lot of personal work as well, just to keep practicing and like kind of directing where I want my style to go. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's, that's how I would define it. What would you, how would you describe your style? 
Mm, I think it's it's really loud. It's you know bold and vibrant. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm usually I don't work with like muted colors. I don't. I usually go for like the big contrast, the really very saturated. Um, when I work with lettering, I like to be very expressive. I mean, I've been through all, you know, the journey to get to this particular style, right? Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm holding up one of her pieces of art. If you're on YouTube and it says loud, yeah. <laughs> the, the lettering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it's been a journey. I've been through many different styles to get here, um, but this is what I would think is where I'm most comfortable. You know, like mm-hmm. where I'm in my zone is doing really loud, expressive work, um, working with abstract sh- shapes. You know, just geometric shapes and simple, very simple illustration. Like I do hearts and lightning bolts and um, Mm -hmm. smiley faces you know I am not a person who illustrates like realistic you know people portraits things like that yeah I I almost like you're bridging the gap between graphic designer and illustrator and I want to know like how did you get there like how did you arrive at this like working in this way where the words, the letters, the the shapes are all very expressive and very much evoke some sort of feeling, but could almost be like exist very, very naturally and comfortably in a graphic design kind of world. Yeah. It's funny you, you say you say it like that because um so I never went to school for illustration specifically. I'm mm-hmm. a I'm an advertising major and I I wanted to become an art director when I was in college. And when I was in college, I started doing freelance design work with my now husband. He was my friend in college. And we just started freelancing mm-hmm. as a graphic. I started as a graphic designer and I stayed that way as a freelance graphic designer for 10 years, for over 10 years. So, and, but, I always loved, you know, drawing. I've always loved typography. So I was doing it on the side just for fun, just Mm -hmm. practicing, just, you know, silly things on the side. And slowly, you know, I, I found out that lettering could become a career, which I didn't know. I thought it was Mm -hmm. like just fonts. Um, And I started investing in that, like, okay, maybe one day in the future I could become a lettering artist. So let's start practicing more and more. And that's kind of how it started. And slowly I stopped working as a graphic designer and started just doing more and more client work as an illustrator. So I feel like, I feel like graphic design is my, like, it's my bedrock, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, it's where Mm -hmm. I'm super safe and slowly I'm still starting out as an illustrator, I feel. So I Mm -hmm. am slowly, you know, branching out and exploring other kinds of illustrative um, paths for me. Um, So, yeah, I feel like very much of my work is, is still, rooted in graphic design because of that because it's what i've been doing for the past 10 years now i don't Mm -hmm. do it anymore but it's a recent thing so yeah how long have you been doing this the this more illustrative style um around around six years ago i started practicing lettering Mm -hmm. and then like i've i was picked up by a representation agency in the u.s Mm-hmm. And that's when I really started getting more client work, which mm-hmm. was four years ago. Mm-hmm. But only only in 2021 is that I like re- left my last uh, graphic design client behind, said goodbye, mm-hmm. said I'm I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be an illustrator. And so it was it's it's super recent that I can call myself only an illustrator <laughs> and not anything else anymore. That's awesome. Only Congratulations. An only an illustrator. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Well, I was looking at your work and um and I I've talked about this before on the podcast that my I, I used to work in graphic design as well. 
And my boss really pushed me towards doing basically what you're doing, hand lettering. Um, I took a class in, in college on hand lettering, and I even pushed to illustrate the hand lettering on a couple of my books. Cool. So, so yeah, so I, 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 um, I love draw, designing letters like you do. Um, I love it's, it. It's, it's it's a neat skill for illustrators to have. Um, Absolutely, I, I, like you know, it's it's it makes you more marketable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it was super comfortable for me when I was starting because you can't like you have these very specific rules you have to follow. You have predefined shapes you want to you know, nail. So it's a lot easier to start for me. It was a lot easier to start with letters than it, it is to like, let's draw human, a human figure or like a, mm -hmm. a, a landscape or, you know, because it's, it's so wide open with letters. Mm -hmm. You, you, it's not that open. You have very specific uh, guidelines and rules and, you know, so it was easier. And also I really love typography. So I felt super, um, comfortable there exploring and growing in that direction first mm -hmm. so uh you were you getting like prior to getting the the work with the agency was how were you getting your client work that you're doing uh via via word of mouth mostly Just word of mouth. friends yeah friends and you know i had an instagram which was uh, mm -hmm. Instagram was still good in pushing out your work to new people. So I had an Instagram page that I started uh, uploading my stuff to. And, but I was always been like super um, shy in selling myself. So <clears throat> I don't think I would have gotten to where I am today without the agency because they really helped me mm. grow and push and just be better at um, trying out new styles and also like just facing your fears as an illustrator. Like your imposter syndrome is going to be there. It's going to be screaming, mm -hmm. but you just got to go and, you know, sell yourself um, if that's something you want to live off of. Right. Yeah. So we get this question so many times. I don't know if you get it a lot too, but how do you get an agent? Right. So I want to ask you, how did you get your agent? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um i was it was really a look kind of a lucky break i was following him uh he was this this uh drew who is my my agent he was mm -hmm. uh, an illustrator as well he was a lettering artist so i was just following him on instagram and then <clears throat> he went through a, a career change and he decided that he would be much better at representing artists <clears throat> than as an artist himself so he was going through that change mm -hmm. And then suddenly, you know, Drew Melton stopped being Drew Melton on Instagram and changed to closer and closer. And I was like, what's closer and closer? When did I start following these these people? <laughs> but, you know, they posted they posted good stuff. So I, I was following them. And then mm -hmm. one time he, pub, he posted something and I just commented, oh, my God, there's so many. He posted like a, um, it was a portfolio of the artists he was representing at the time. Yeah. And I just com I commented like, oh, my God, so many great artists here something like that. And mm -hmm. that comment made him go into my Instagram page. And then he saw what I was posting and he was like, Oh, you have some good stuff. Let's talk. Mm. Yeah. And that's, that's how I got like in. And I'm like, so grateful to be in right. <laughs> every year. I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> the, the one time you weren't shy. <laughs> and it, uh... yeah, exactly. <laughs> And exactly. it worked in your but, favor. You know, I was kind of, I was really lucky. You know, he was starting out, he was looking for new artists. Now it's like a huge roster with many people. And mm -hmm. he's I feel like he's much more picky as to who mm -hmm. gets in now. Um so I would say if you're not as lucky as I was, um that it's really important that you find the style that you excel most at, you know, like you're really mm -hmm happy with your work you're really flowing well with mm -hmm. your work and then don't be shy about pushing it and sending your portfolio to the agencies because they are always looking for like the, uh, the roster is always changing so mm -hmm. you kind of have to be on their mind to mm -hmm. be picked mm -hmm. yeah that's super now, cool. you're you're living in uh, brazil right 
Yeah. Is your agent also in Brazil? No, he represents me only in the U.S. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. if you go to closerandcloser.co, uh, you'll see, really, it's, I mean, it is a, a kind of a vibe that he's got going, like a very specific, I could see who would not be uh, someone he did, he's interested in, and, in, interested in, and I could see definitely the kind of artist that he would, and you you fit into that really well, but yet there, each of these artists is doing something a little different that yeah. no one else does. So I would say, you know, the, to kind of follow up on this strategy for people listening, it's like, make sure you're creating artwork that looks like something mm. va- valuable, you know, something that clients want to mm-hmm. reach out and to agents, but look at agencies that are doing and representing the kind of work that you're doing. Cause yeah. if I sent him my work and said, Hey, would you be interested in representing me? I know it'd be a flat. No. Cause I, I'm not doing, you know, this, this, my stuff, I don't think is this trendy. <laughs> like it's, mm-hmm. this stuff is really, <laughs> really cool stuff. I actually know one of these other artists, on here as well uh what's his name dave arcade he's pretty cool yeah um, he's awesome he's, he, he's based in utah will oh um, i didn't yeah. know that he's yeah, such you a might... funny guy yeah he is <laughs> <laughs> he is we i think we had a, a phone call once so let me i want to ask you what your the way you work is it it's obviously digital on some yeah. level but i see you're also doing some traditional stuff as well i'm just curious what where you're most comfortable, what tools do you like using, um, and, and how you go about making this stuff? Yeah, well, coming from coming from uh, graphic design, I'm very comfortable with vector, mostly mm-hmm. vector, more than Photoshop, honestly. Um, so I'm okay with finalizing art in, in vector form if client needs, but it's not my favorite one it's not my favorite medium to work in right now Mm -hmm. um i have been just doing a lot of digital drawing on procreate on the ipad that's been my like if i have oh wow Uh yeah if i have very little time i just do i just work on procreate it's such a good tool yeah it's amazing it it like it's a game changer i feel for me like it made Mm -hmm. my work much faster and much more you know, streamlined just because revi- like revisions are much faster than on paper on Procreate. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's what I that's what I've been doing mostly. You know, just Procreate. But I do love uh, traditional mediums. I love working with markers. I mean, I feel like I'm a child when it comes to illustration. Like, <laughs> what do you love to write? Markers. <laughs> yeah. Crayons, the markers. You know, crayons. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love working with like very pigmented markers um and i've also done some hand some murals uh hand painting some murals as well yeah like that one so i'm holding (laughs) one up but and i have a question on that are these um, murals in the u.s or are they in brazil that one that one was in in the u.s this was like a dream project for me Uh, the client flew me to new orleans and i stayed there at a hotel for a week uh, and I went to the event and I live painted it in front of the, you know, people who are going to the event. It was 17,000 people, it was huge. And it was an amazing, amazing project because I had a lot of freedom. The client was like, we just want, to, want you to do your thing. The only thing we wow. want is the wor- this word. And I got to meet people, talk to people, which is something I, you know, don't usually get to do because I work alone. Mm-hmm. So it was, I really hope I to like get, your, you know. You, I, I'm looking at on your website, you've got all these photos of you making it and there's just like hundreds of people walking past, like watching and looking at <laughs> it. Yeah. And you've got this yeah. cool like jumpsuit that you're wearing too with like paint all over yeah. it. You look like a real artist, <laughs> like right? getting your hands yeah, dirty not, and doing stuff. That's, we're not real artists. <laughs> no, we're just. I don't have paint all over us. No. Yeah. But, <laughs> so how many murals have you done now? Um, uh, I don't know the exact number. Let me think. Not, not that many. I, it's under 10 for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
it's because, you know, I was going, I was on a roll and then I had a baby and then things changed completely. You know, <laughs> murals, murals take, you know, take a lot of commitment. You know, mm -hmm. you have to be there the whole day and with a baby that wasn't possible. And mm -hmm. then after I had her, after I had her, I just never picked it back up. Um, mm. But I would be, just because it's a big commitment of oh, time. Yeah. You know, I was listening to your uh podcast and you were talking about how uh, children's book books are like a marathon and I was mm -hmm. thinking I would never be able to I would never be able to work on something like that just because I need to push out my stuff so quickly you know turnaround mm -hmm. has to be so fast um, although I would love to one day maybe <laughs> uh, <laughs> and murals are the same like you have to you have to be able to book like this week I'm doing this this thing And it takes many, many hours in the day. And I still haven't been able to make my schedule work around mm -hmm. murals again. How old's your daughter? My oldest is two and my youngest is just eight months old. Oh, wow. <laughs> two, two kids. Yeah. Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so so murals are, are kind of like, it. I, if I understand it, it's typically something that the client wants done in as short amount of time as possible. Like they don't want a mural to take two months. They want it to be like done no. in a week yeah. or a day if, if they could. Right. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Exactly. I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. How do you, I, I'm curious about murals. because this is, this is something that I've, I've never really done. Um, and it's, it's always sort of fascinating to me. It looks, it looks kind of, tedious but fun as well you know mm -hmm, i'm mm -hmm. curious how do you like how do you do it what's the process start to finish uh, i assume it starts on paper or on your ipad you're figuring it out but then how do you get it on the wall well there are a bunch of ways you can look okay so you start on paper or mm -hmm. digitally you have to consider like um the texture of the wall so if it's too textured you can put a lot of detail if it's mm -hmm. a, if it's you know internal if it's on the outside what the weather is going to be like a bunch of things you have to consider just regarding the wall itself um then to get it to get the artwork onto the wall i usually use a projector if there's enough you know uh space to place the projector uh and 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 i just trace it with a pencil and then mm -hmm. go in with the with paint after. That's the easiest way. But mm -hmm. you can do like a grid method, like you know, mm -hmm. you grid it, you grid it out, and then you retrace it. Um, and you can freehand it as well. If it's something <laughs> simple, you can tr you can also freehand it. There are a lot of muralists who freehand, but it's. I'd be hard. so freaked out about that because I know yeah. one of the eyes would be like massive, uh -huh. and the other one would be like too small, and because of my perspective yeah. was wrong. <laughs> it's really hard i haven't i've never freehanded anything i've worked with grid and i've worked mm -hmm. with a uh, projector how do you know like how much paint you need like just a practical <sighs> thing like that <laughs> i think it works i mean i think it's like any other thing it comes with practice you have to mm -hmm. have done a bunch of murals to kind of know um but you know i buy paint at It's not like a special paint. It's paint from the that you would use to paint your walls anyway. So mm -hmm. you can kind of calculate the square meters um, mm. or square feet in your case, and how much you're you're gonna need for for your specific mural. But it can change a lot as well because of texture it takes up a lot more paint, and then mm -hmm. some colors need more coats than other colors. So yellows are terrible, or um, reds are also can be hard. Uh, so you kind of need to practice there then mm -hmm. to get really good mm -hmm. yeah yeah well you you mentioned imposter syndrome mm -hmm. um what what would your advice be to someone up and coming who might be listening who hasn't been to a formal art school who thinks they're they're doing pretty good but they they're not really sure where they fit in to the illustration landscape and maybe they haven't had a, a ton of success yet, but what would, what would you say to someone like that who feels that they might have that? Yeah. Well, 
maybe I'm not the best person to give advice on that because I really feel like I'm an imposter most, I know sometimes, um, but, um, you know, it's hard not having been to actually not having been to school, you know, to formal training. You feel, um, sometimes you feel like maybe you're not as good as other people who have, you know, but, and I understand that that's normal, but I would say it's irrelevant, you know, it, is it relevant if you, if you're getting work? And if mm -hmm. your clients are happy, and if you are happy with what you're creating, then why is it relevant what your background is? You know, that's mm -hmm. that's what I tr try to tell myself. Like, I'm really proud of the work I do. I really am. I like what I do, and it makes me happy, and I love doing it. You know, when I'm working, I'm, I'm so in the zone, you know, so mm -hmm. it feels right. So if it feels right for you and clients are happy, then what else is there that you're looking for, right? Right. Um, that's what I would say. Imposter syndrome, you know, is, is always going to exist. I mean, there are many experienced, amazing illustrators who feel it. And mm -hmm. it's normal, it's human to feel insecure and, you know, compare yourself to others. But if it's not a helpful thing, then... You can think about it, but you can't let it run the show. You have to mm -hmm. push, push forward anyway. Yeah, it's it's um, it's sad to me when, you know, um, a lot of artists, myself included, when I first started out, I wanted I wanted the market to define me, or I thought I wanted the market to define me, when really um, it's me. Only only I can define myself. Mm -hmm. and 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 my validation um you know if you look at if you look at artists through history a lot of artists had to fight against um the what was popular and what was in demand and they had to go their own way and they had to do their own thing and they were never getting commissions to you know a, a commission reaffirms your, your yeah your, it validates you right or mm -hmm. or getting um accepted by a by a um, an agent or a rep is a validation yeah, yeah. but uh yeah so somehow as artists we need to um not necessarily seek the approval of others but yeah. but really uh really feel um the drive that we have within to to fuel our work you know i always think of it, of it like when i when a kid is doing something that they really love they are never thinking Am I good at this? Why am I doing this? Is this a side hustle? Am I going to get some money out of this? And, you know, mm. would clients like this? You know, kids just do things because they want to do it and then they go ahead and do it, <laughs> right? They don't ha they don't add all these layers of thought processes in front of their decision to just go ahead and do something. And illustration for me is exactly like that. You know, I would be doing it even if I didn't, if it wasn't my career, I would still be doing it for fun. So why do I take the fun out of it completely by thinking, are clients going to like this? Is this trendy? <laughs> you know, is this? It, it? Um, so I try to m remind myself of that, um, that to try and stop all the thinking that goes around it and just do what feels right. Um, I think it's the best path. It has been the best path for me anyway, to find my, my space in illustration. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really cool. I have this, like this theory that there's like three reasons that people make art. And number one is just this innate need to create. And then number two is they're not good at anything else and they have to make a living somehow. So <laughs> they're going to, they're going to yeah. create art for survival, essentially like physical to provide for physical needs. And then three, um, they use art for like community, like they need um, some sort of validation or they need to yeah. use it as commentary for uh, as, of those three things, you know, using art to be a part of a conversation, using art to for self-fulfillment or using art to like as a means to an end to provide for yourself. Where does where do you fall mm -hmm. on that spectrum or is it, a, you know, a little bit of all all of them? I think definitely. Definitely 
number one is like the main thing for mm-hmm. me. I really just need to be creating stuff. Um, I think I've, it's the one thing I've always done throughout my life, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so definitely one. And then two is like the happy icing on the cake. Like it's a good thing that I found a way to make money out of something that I love. Like mm-hmm. when, when my husband, when I tell my daughter, mama, mama's working right now. And I'm like drawing on a piece of paper. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And my husband makes fun of me all the time because it's like, yeah, mama's working right now. Because, uh, <laughs> right. But it's, 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 I feel so blessed to have found a way and to have had people cross my path and make this happen that I get to make a living out of something that, that I would be doing anyway, uh, mm-hmm. and that I love to do. So I'm curious about, and you know, couples who one's a creator, one's an artist, they have kids. I'm curious about the, like the division of labor. How do you, mm-hmm. how, where's your life balance? Like, how do you manage, um, you know, the home life versus the work life? I assume you work at home as well or do you have a, a yeah. studio that you go to okay so i'm just wondering how yeah. you do that um currently things are a little crazy because of because you know i have a small baby who's still breastfeeding so there's not mm-hmm. really much of a structured schedule mm-hmm. um my husband also works in he's a graphic designer he works from home mm-hmm. as well so we split everything as much as we can when he's got something then i'm with the kids more and vice versa Mm. um and i'm lucky enough to have a person that comes and helps around the house every day because it's been kind of crazy with two kids at home all Mm day um so honestly i it's been kind of hectic this past few months but you know, somehow we made it work. Whenever there's a window of uh, space, I try to be really focused and work really hard. Kids have made me much more efficient. That's, that's what I feel. There is (laughs) zero room for procrastination. There's zero room for like, let's just browse the web for now. Um, No, it's like when I have a window, it's go, go, go. And, Mm -hmm. and I've actually, I feel, I feel like I've done, I've worked a lot more these past two years than I have uh, before I had kids, just because it's it's made me a lot more focused. Yeah, yeah. So how do you balance making stuff with marketing stuff? Do you just hand that all over to your agent, or do you like do you use social media to try and get more work, or to try and grow an audience for your work, or or um, is, like I'm just curious how you balance mm-hmm. between that, like, and then also when do you do personal work as well? So it's that's a very mm-hmm. layered question, but I'm curious mm-hmm. how that all works for you. Well, I try to do personal work whenever I don't have client work, so I have a few what what I call the, the premium hours of my day. That's mm-hmm. when my oldest daughter is in school, so I have like five hour, four or five hours that are my premium hours. Mm-hmm. If I don't have any client work that's going to happen during those hours, then I focus on doing personal work. Like mm. just, I work on personal projects that I have that are going on, or I start something new, or I, you know, practice something that I'm, I've been meaning to practice. Um, and about marketing, well, I'm terrible at it. I'm really <laughs> terrible. <laughs> and you're it. like all the other illustrators. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, there are a few, like, few very good ones and then the rest of us. I feel like um, it's I, – I was not born for social media, you know, but I have to do it, so I do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I try to post everything I do to Instagram which is the one that I use the most. And then when I have a big project, I upload it to Behance because Behance is a little bit easier, more controlled, and you only have to, you know, to update it like once a quarter is fine. You mm-hmm. don't have to do it all the time like Instagram. And 
I have in the past sent emails to past clients, but I haven't done it recently, but I should get back mm. to that. Um, but honestly, I feel like super self-conscious to just go in and say, hi, remember me? We worked uh, in 2018. Here's what I've been doing recently, which is silly. You know, they don't have, they're fine with, I feel like they're fine with getting those emails. Uh, but I feel super self-conscious about doing that. So I haven't. So done here, uh, I, I know a way to make it uh, not self-conscious. Okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> you ready for this? Because yes. I used to work Jeez. for, um, I used to work for a, um, a studio. It was like a commercial. We made commercials, like animations for commercials. And we used a lot of like outside talent that we would mm -hmm. like, oh, for this commercial, let's get this guy to do this thing. And, and, and so what we would get uh, like around Christmas time are like cards from these people just saying, you know, Merry Christmas. Hope you guys had a good year. And it's their artwork. Like here's mm -hmm. something they made. Um, and then maybe sometime in the middle of the year, there'd just be like another postcard or another, like a, a physical thing, a physical not, a, not thing. an email. And, uh, and it was just a way for them to like touch base, like, you know, it'd be a happy new year or it'd be spring is here. You know, you kind of use the shifting, the, 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 the kind of the shifting of seasons and time to have an excuse to create something personal and then mm -hmm. send it over. And it just kept, kept, kept them in our minds and be like, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, let's, you know, contact her or something. So that's just a, it's just an idea, just an option. It's you can do an email idea, version actually. of it too, you know? Yeah. But I think, you know, how many emails do they get a day? Right. So a physical thing mm -hmm. is much more memorable. I think um, it's sad that we don't send them as much as we did before. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's actually the most effective kind of marketing you can do because mm -hmm. it's personal um, you know, when you talk directly to your client, it, it, um, the person knows you, he knows how you work. He already is familiar with you uh, and knows that you're, you know, your answer fast or you're on time. You don't, you know, deliver files the way they want mm -hmm. them. So <clears throat> I feel like it's the most effective. It's much more effective than just, you know, just um, posting your, your artwork on Instagram to a huge audience that don't. Mm -hmm don't even relate to you right. um but i think that the fact that it is personal is what makes me a little bit shyer you know in doing it but mm -hmm. i'll i know that closer and closer does they reach out they reach out to past clients all the time so mm -hmm. i trust that they're doing they're doing that for me as well <laughs> well you keep getting work right so <laughs> so something, yeah something right. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you you also mentioned uh, that the, the the mural job was kind of a dream project. Yeah, I'm wondering what 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 else is on your horizon of of dream projects that you would love to be able to do that you maybe haven't been able to do yet. Um, I would love to do a book a book cover. I've never done a book cover. Mm. Um. I think it would be so cool to have like a physical thing. Uh -huh. I have the dream of illustrating a, ch a children's book, but that's like in the future. Um, there's a lettering artist that I really love. Her name is Jessica Hish. I don't know if you're familiar with her. I was going to ask if you she were, if she, if you were a yeah. fan. <laughs> She's oh, awesome. Yeah. I'm a huge fan. She's yeah. awesome. And she did that, like she did a children's book, you know, three, I think yeah. now. Um, yeah. So it's possible for us lettering artists who are not writers, who are not, you know, maybe not professional illustrators in the children's book uh, scene to mm -hmm. do, to do something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. and yeah, I think those two are my big, big mm -hmm. ones right now editorial work you, you know the funny thing about um uh children's books is for a lot of a lot of us i think is by the time our children's books come out those of us that are having kids you know the kids are often too old to appreciate if we do the younger <laughs> ones that that happened to me you know yeah. so i uh i got into it just a little bit too late and 
Mm-hmm. And my, I could never really read my books to my kids. In fact, one of my kids' friends, the, the friends came over one time and they're like, they're seeing me in their painting. I was actually, this was back when I was painting in acrylic. And and the kid, my kids' friends are like coming into my office and like just looking over my shoulder, like he's painting, you know, like, <laughs> and, and, uh, and my, my son goes, yeah, he, he paints baby stuff for babies, you know, let's go play. Oh. You know? And I was like, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that was Aaron, wasn't it? I'm nothing. <laughs> that was Aaron. Well, he said that, right? Them. It was, it was Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can see like them for, you, for when you have grandkids it will be sweet as well yeah there you go yeah, yeah. grandkids are right around the corner aren't they will <laughs> yeah I, well we have our first one so there you go there you go yeah Yay. um i wanted to ask you to so you've got you've got your future dream projects but what's like super exciting for you right now personal work or client work or whatever like what what is like really getting you going <clears throat> Uh, I am working on a personal project. I've been uh, kind of planning and thinking about it for a year now. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to uh, do f- uh, f- uh, illustration over photography, uh, mm-hmm. kind of collage, but it's not really collage because I'm just drawing. Um, and it's about family, like family stories. So mm. I had a, my grandfather was the first surfer here in Brazil, and he has this beautiful photograph of him with this big, long surfboard. And I was like, this is such a cool story. Is there a way I can tell this story to other people about, you know, how my grandfather became the first Brazilian surfer? Um, and maybe, you know, merge illustration with storytelling. So <clears throat> I'm kind of trying to get that project off the ground right now Mm -hmm. i have two illustrations and the idea is to ask other people to send in their beautiful family stories interesting or even tragic you know just things that you want to tell the world stories that are just too good to be kept in just Mm. in the family and maybe get images to illustrate that so kind of like a humans of new york but from the past and with illustration on top (laughs) yeah that's that's something that i'm really excited because i want to like i get to talk to other people and meet new people and hear about their families and to me is to me that's the most valuable thing like i to the interaction the the the, the exchange that that's gonna happen if Mm -hmm. i can get the project going yeah, that's awesome. First surfer in Brazil. That's that's incredible. Yeah. Right? <laughs> did he, yeah, how did he discover it? Like like the surfboard was so huge. So his father, no, his uncle <clears throat> brought a magazine from the US called Popular Mechanics. I don't know if it still exists. Yeah. Uh-huh. And and it had the like the plans of how you build what was then called a Hawaiian board which Mm -hmm. is the surfboard and it was made out of wood. So he, my uncle had a shop, uh, like a uh, kind of like a space where you can work with your hands and stuff. (laughs) I don't know how to call that. A workshop. Um, A workshop. Yes. And, and my grandfather was like teenager at the time thought that was so cool. He lived on a beach and he was like, okay, maybe I'll try to build one of those Hawaiian boards. And he did. And that's how he became the first surfer in Brazil, him and a oh, best friend. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I watched a, um, a, a show one time, and I can't remember the name of the surfer. It was either Kelly Slater or somebody in that in that age group. Um, and he brought the first um, stubby surfboard to Brazil mm, and gave oh, it to, cool. to one of the kids because they they just didn't have surfboards or anything in any way. That's, I can't yeah. imagine. Have you cool. have you tried surfing? Yeah, it's I'm too it, big. It's hard. <laughs> have you, Mel? Have you tried? I it haven't. Too? No, <laughs> no. You've got to be able Dude. to pop from your from your um, chest to your feet. Yeah. Really, like like you have to be yeah. able to push up from your chest to your feet. And that's after your dog tired from swimming out past the <laughs> <Right>. the breakwater, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like yeah. over and over and over again. 
Yeah. Oh man. Uh, I can't imagine surfing on a wooden board though. Like yeah. that's it was huge. You know yeah. a stand up pedal? You know the mm-hmm. like the yeah. long the paddle long. boards. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it was something like really long like that, made out of wood, super mm-hmm. heavy, needed two people mm-hmm. to carry it to the beach. And the photo of him is really funny because he's like a tiny, tiny little man. And then like the board, like huge, like that. <laughs> so it's such, a, it's such a cool photo and such a cool story. I, I was like, you know, people need to hear about this. And the other yeah. story that I already have illustrated is uh, my husband's grandma. When... So they were they were both Spanish, their grandparents, and uh, it was after the war. They wanted to move to Brazil, but her father wouldn't let her move to Brazil unmarried, but also didn't want them to get married in Spain and move to Brazil because he wasn't sure if they would be able to um, support themselves here. Mm-hmm. So what they did is he's. His father said, her father said, you, the husband, go to Brazil and you get a job. And if you do get a job, then you can marry apart from each other. So she got married to him in Spain and he was in Brazil. It was the weirdest thing. It was Whoa. a marriage apart. Yes. She <laughs> went into the into the church wearing black and got mm-hmm. married alone. And he went to, into the church here in Brazil and got married alone as well. And then she was allowed to come to Brazil to be with him. That's so it was interesting. Cool, yeah. Right? I didn't yeah. even know they did that. <laughs> That's mean, cool. How can, to, how can you get married apart? So, do you, like, what's the photo that you work off it's of? Just for her, that? It's just her addressed as a bride. It's a beautiful yeah. image of her alone. addressed as a bride. Yeah, <laughs> alone. Exactly. <laughs> All That's, alone. That's poignant. I have to send you yeah. my wife's grandfather. Um, when he was a baby, was left at the doorstep of an orphanage in a basket with Whoa. a note. Oh, my God. With a note that said, I'm so sorry I couldn't keep you. You know, please take care of him. Someday I'll return to to be able to get him. And the way you'll know it's me, um, he had a ripped dollar bill. And she said, I have the other half of this. So, you know, I'm your mother. So that you can match wow. match them. And I always thought that was a cool story. That's beautiful. <laughs> Did yeah. they ever get back together? So it was a it was a mystery uh, that my wife's mom and her and her aunt finally solved, like through genealogy and through like DNA tests and everything, because they finally figured out who his actual mother was and and. And they went to the orphanage up in, it's in Canada. He was Canadian, went up there and they met like all of these family members that they had never known before and stuff. But he, in his life, he never, he never wow. m- knew who his mother was. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Interesting, huh? Right. And he, he, he ended up becoming a really successful businessman and like just, uh, just a amazing guy. Like, uh, you know, the stories I've heard about him. I met him after he had, um, just before he had died and he had already kind of lost his, his memory and and stuff. But, um, yeah, just a cool guy. So there's, you know, you put the word out for family stories and you're going to, you're going to have a full book. (laughs) The hard part will be illustrating all of them. (laughs) Exactly. And like, it's so exciting because I love hearing those stories and I feel like other people will, will like to hear them too. Yeah. 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 So I, a couple more questions going back to, um, I I guess the economics behind all of this and, and, you know, if you're not comfortable sharing like how much a job is, but I'm curious, like what the range is for like a mural project, low end, high end, what would the range be for like, uh, you know, one of your jobs that you're getting, um, you know, we have the people who listen to this are a lot of them like how do i make a living how do i how do i get into the professional side of this and one of their big questions mm-hmm. is is it even sustainable is it is it something that i can you know support my myself on and i'm just curious about that in in regards to this particular kind of illustration work that you do um well it's definitely definitely sustainable, but 
you it, it helps if you have a, a style that is commercial mm -hmm. um you know there are many really amazing artists super talented but maybe their work is too I don't know. Maybe their work just doesn't sell so well, or, or, or mm -hmm. there's a limit limited um, pool of clients that would need that kind of specific right. work. It's not that they don't sell, but you know, you need to work harder at, at mm -hmm. getting clients. Right. Um, but yes, it's definitely sustainable. I'm in a lucky position because I live in Brazil, and our currency here is really devalued compared to the dot compared to the dollar oh. so i earn in dollars and live off our currency in brazil so mm -hmm. it's even more comfortable for me here in mm -hmm. the sense that i don't need to get as much work to be able to live off of it yeah um but you know murals are actually don't, don't pay as well as commercial work just because mm -hmm. there's not much licensing potential there mm -hmm. um it's just the you know it's just a mural and that's it it's mm -hmm. it's it's not usual for clients to use that image afterwards and then you get some money out of licensing it for other usages and everything um i'm not the best person to tell you how much a mural is going for we usually charge like around uh, for square meters mm -hmm. um but I can't, I can't really tell you the cur the current rate honestly because okay. it's been two years since I did it. Yeah. Since I did it, but this this particular one for Keller Williams, I think they paid me twelve thousand dollars, something like that. Okay, which was amazing. That, it was a really a good, good payday. Pay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a really good pay, and I got to go to New Orleans and like eat all the amazing food yeah. and stay there for a week. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Did you get, did you get really some oysters? Excited. While you're there, I, I you know I didn't because I hate seafood. Oh, but I did. It, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the best place for me. But I did get a lot of fried chicken, like a lot, a lot oh, of yeah. fried stuff. That stuff's good too. Absolutely yeah, spicy, spicy cooking. sauces. Yeah, yeah, and so so they could have paid you in fried chicken for that mural, and you you would have you would have done it. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, just just the just the trip itself. You know, it was like you come here, you work for free, and then we send you back. And I would be okay. Yeah. <laughs> when do I go? <laughs> but so, to yeah, our to our but, listeners, don't don't take that deal. You got to get paid for your work, otherwise you said <laughs> yeah, don't take the yeah, chicken yeah. deal. Don't people. hear don't hear don't hear my don't listen to my advice. Yeah. <laughs> and then the the good thing about having an agent is that they. I mean, they do take a percentage of your pay in closer mm -hmm. and closer, you know, but um, they also push for the best possible budgets. You know, they right. also, like, I would never have the stomach even to push right. for some of these budgets and they work really, really hard to get you the best possible pay. So you do get a cut, but it's, in my case, completely worth it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. to work with them that's cool yeah yeah i was i was i was just uh interested in, in that and, and two i i love that like we get to meet you before you're doing book covers and your children's book and we could say <laughs> we knew mel <laughs> We knew Mel uh, when, when, you know, we had her on the um, podcast first, you know. Yeah. And then you can call me back to talk about the books. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, I think, I think we're going to wrap it up there. This has been a great conversation. Did you have any follow up, any questions, Will? No, just a, it's just a fun career, fun work. You, sh you guys should um, check it out if you haven't. We'll put a link. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, along with the podcast and also on the YouTube channel. But, uh, but yeah, the, the uh, doing the uh, hand lettering thing, that's a great companion to illustration that a lot mm -hmm. of, I'm surprised a lot yeah. of illustrators don't know how to design type and letters and there's a well. alternate universe out there where Jake, that's Jake's uh, main, main gig. Is. Yeah. But the thing is, yeah. Jake, you're really good at graphic design. I mean, like you have, I love it. I love yeah, doing you're it. You're good at it. And, and a lot of illustrators, like I say, they, for whatever reason, they don't have that skill. And in today's social media world where you, 
you know, you, you want to, you kind of have to do a lot of your own marketing. That's a really mm-hmm. good thing to have. Yeah. Especially yeah. like yeah, if you're doing a Kickstarter or anything like that to be able to, to have a design sensibility for communication. You know, just, and, and I don't know if you did this when you were young, Mel, but like I would, I would like, I would like copy letters as close as I could. Like I'd get out of a sheet of money and I'd be like, okay, how did they do the D, you know, on that? And mm-hmm. I'd do the D with the little uh-huh. serifs on it. And I and then I'd write my own letters and I'd try to like, okay, if there's no R on here, so let's figure out how an R might look. Is that the kind of thing you did? Yes. And that's like the best practice for lettering. Like you start with one letter and try to figure out what the alphabet would look like mm-hmm. without reference, you know, where uh-huh. the you know, the fat parts of the letter are and the thin parts of the letter are. And um, and yeah, and lettering is like, it's a really good, especially if you work with books, um, it's a really important skill to have, I feel, because then you can control everything that goes Mm -hmm. on the cover of the book. Like it's not, you don't have to use a font and try to make it work with your illustration. You control it 100%. Everything is illustrated there. So... I feel like it's a really, and you know, if you illustrate like com- complex shapes and stuff, it's really easy to do to jump to letters. Like you, you, mm-hmm. you guys can do it. So I encourage every one of you to give it a hand, try it out. All right. So that was Mel. How how we pronounce her last name? Chehe, Chehe, Chehe. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, that was cool. Really interesting, and and um, yeah, uh, she's super nice too. Like, <laughs> just such a sweet, <laughs> sweet person. Um, uh, the reason too that that I wanted to have her on this podcast is she does work that is completely different from what you, me, and Will or you, me, and Lee do, mm-hmm. and uh, and I thought it would be just interesting and and kind of nice for our listeners because i i myself was and i know if i'm interested in it the listener is going to be interested in it as well and and right what well and there's a lot of people a lot of people that listen to us that probably want to do hand lettering Mm -hmm. or you know more graphic work one of the things that that she mentioned a couple of times that i that i took away was she said that um she she mentioned that she would do this work you know the the feeling of wanting to do it for free you know yeah. just doing it anyway yeah and that's to me that's when i know i'm dealing with a a true artist i think mm-hmm. i i've known a few people that have actually gotten into illustration over the years that didn't last and that was the thing they were missing was mm-hmm. that passion to create no matter what mm-hmm. you know and that is also our downfall as as illustrators because we we love our work so much that we're almost willing to do it for free and that's one reason why we don't often get paid as much right. as we should and so that's something to consider i just made a youtube video on my youtube channel at will terry about how to get more money for the illustration work that you're doing to mm-hmm. tackle this very thing but but yeah that she's she's a great personality Cool. Well, I'll take us out. Um, and, and by the way, check out her, her website. Uh, we mentioned it at the beginning, but check out her website. It's Mel, uh, we'll, we'll spell it M E L C E R R I.com. And you can follow her on Instagram also at um, it's at M E L C E R R I. And really just doing some cool stuff over there on Instagram as well. Um, all right, everybody, Three Point Perspective is made possible by SVS Learn. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts today have been Will Terry and Jake Parker. Again, Lee was out on assignment, so he couldn't join us today. But uh, you can find Will Terry's work at willterry.com. You can also find his work on Instagram at willterryart. Lee White's work, you can find at leewhiteillustration.com and at Instagram on Lee White Illo, or on Instagram at Lee White Illo. <laughs> and my work's over at jakeparkerart.com and I'm on Instagram at Jake Parker. Podcast produced by Daniel Two, that's Daniel T U. And you can find his work at daniel2.co. Uh, special thanks to Master of Production, David Bro. 
keeper of the curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, and boy, is he keeping the curriculum lately, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's giving us lots of notes. <laughs> we appreciate it. Chief Operations Officer Lisa Fott, and a thank you to Lily Howell for our show notes. Now, go draw something. <laughs>